Right, hello everyone. Welcome to today's session. Just wait a minute or so to allow everyone to join us. Great session ahead of us. So brace yourself, we will commence very shortly. This session is on circular procurement and I'm absolutely thrilled and looking forward to today's agenda and amazing panel of speakers we have. So um, it's an earlier than usual time slot, but I'm delighted to see that many of you already joined us. So that's absolutely brilliant. We will get underway very shortly. Make yourself comfortable, grab a glass of water, a sandwich, little snack, and most importantly, your notebook, because there will be a lot of insights and practical advice. You can see the number of participants is going up. It's brilliant. Please use the, use the chat box. Tell us where you're dialing in from. And maybe make a nod on what you expect to learn from today's session as well. All right, I can see there's people joining from all over the region. Fabulous. Yes, Travis will go through the Zoom keeping and um, the webinar is being recorded. I'll, uh, hello from Singapore as well. I'll just share a few Zoom keeping notes very shortly. Wow, what a spread of uh, attendance from many countries. Please keep that coming. All right, I think we can get cracking. Um, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katawa, everyone, uh, welcome. My name is Giovanni Ferrante. I'm the marketing manager for SIPs in the ANZ region. It's my absolute pleasure to um, provide a short welcome uh, to you all today. This session, as I was mentioning before, is about circular procurement. Um, we are absolutely delighted to have collaborated with, uh, with this webinar with an organization um, that has at, at the core of its, its purpose, um, making uh, sustainability credential more accessible to business. And this organization is giveable and you'll soon be hearing from um, co-founder Francis Hepkin uh, very shortly. So before we get started, um, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where I'm sitting from, and that's the land of the Wurundjeri, Wurrung and Boronong peoples of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respect to the elders past and present and extend their respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people on the webinar today. We have a record breaking attendance and registrations over 220, which um, is a strong signal of the interest around the topic and, and uh, testament to the appeal that our amazing speakers have. Um, now, very, very shortly, for those of you that don't know SIPS, uh, the Chatter Institute of Procurement and Supply, we are the largest uh, global professional body for procurement and supply management, dedicated to promoting best practice, raising standard and continuous improvement. Um, quick Zoom keeping notes, uh, same rules apply to all of our webinars. So all the SDs are in a listen only mode, but that doesn't mean you can't uh, interact with the uh, with the rest of the participant and indeed our panelists, please use the chat box to um, make comments and remarks and the Q&A functionality to put your questions and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, make sure you do share with everyone. Um, I also like to advise that the webinar is currently being recorded as you can probably see on your screen and we'll share a copy of this recording um, later next week. So again, today's about circular procurement, a, a strategic approach about uh, buying goods and services that maximizes value uh, for organization and society while minimizing the impact on the environment. So this requires a, a movement to circular economy, requires a, a really strong change um, to the fundamental aspect of how we, we do procurement. And 
We are very proud to uh, have a six representative on, on an important um, group that's been instituted by um, Planet Arc, and this is the Australian Circular Economy Hub for Human and Working Group, established a few months ago. Um, our very own Tanya Harris is part of that group, whose um, aim is to um, contribute to the development of circular procurement practices by uh, providing advices, metrics, priority areas, and ultimately a roadmap to how we develop more sustainable procurement models. Now, without taking um, any more time from our amazing panel, I'd like to massively thank you, Francis Atkin from, from Giveable for uh, the, the awesome support in putting all of this together and handing over to you, Francis, to introduce the session and the speakers. Thank you again very much. Wonderful. Let's get started. Thank you for that introduction, Giovanni, uh, and welcome to everyone joining today. The topic for this webinar is how circular procurement helps, sustainability, helps achieve sustainability targets. And as Giovanni mentioned, this webinar is jointly hosted by the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, or SIPS, and Giveable. And we thank SIPS for kindly opening up this webinar to all of us, so people from a range of different functions within an organisation and indeed from all over the world, um, in addition to procurement and supply managers can listen in on this important discussion. For those that have just joined, I am Francis, the CEO and co-founder of Giveable. We are a new technology platform, making it easy for businesses to discover, track and report on the sustainability credentials and attributes of suppliers. We're on a mission to help organizations reach their sustainability targets faster, and the platform has been specifically designed for this purpose. Currently, the platform covers more than 150,000 suppliers across over 300 local and global credentials and continues to grow. It automatically maps supplier credentials to sustainability targets, sustainable development goals or SDGs, and widely used reporting frameworks, translating millions of data relationships using the latest technology. I have the pleasure of being your moderator today. Firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are all meeting today. From where I am dialing in, this is the Gurringai people on the northern beaches of Sydney. We pay our respects to their elders past and present, and I also wish to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Secondly, um, and just to reiterate some of the housekeeping that Gio Giovanni mentioned, please do say hello, and we've already had many people um, introducing themselves in the chat. Tell us where you are dialing in from, which organization you work at, and what your role and function is. We'd love to hear from you. The format for today is Q&A, and we have prepared two to three questions to ask each of our expert panelists. Do, please do submit your questions via the Q&A function, and I'll look to weave them in as we go, and also save some for the panel towards the end of this session. So now onto the topic how circular procurement helps achieve sustainability targets. Today's subject has attracted a huge amount of interest and we've had well over 200 registrations for this webinar and it comes as no surprise. The circular economy is a sustainability concept gaining traction and entering the mainstream conversation in this area. At the same time, many companies and governments have or are setting sustainability targets and they span the full spectrum of sustainability across environmental, social and governance issues. Across environmental considerations, the types of targets that we are seeing get set include things such as net zero supply chains, resource efficiency and conservation, zero waste to landfill, recycled content use, sustainable packaging and more. This agenda is coming from boards and C-suites of businesses of all sizes, and these are targets that are already or will filter into KPIs because of broader knock-on effects for organisations. As a corporate finance professional for over 10 years, sustainable finance and impact investing is my other favourite topic, and the relationship between sustainable business practices and the capital markets is a very real one, and in my view, one of the key drivers pushing the corporate agenda in this space. But it doesn't stop there. Other stakeholders, such as customers, employees and consumers, continue to apply pressure as well, which means businesses need to take action, they need to track their progress, and they need to communicate it. I often say sustainability is a journey, and as we will learn in this session, 
that is no more true than when it comes to the circular economy. That is why it is so wonderful to see the cross-functional interest in today's topic and reflects a growing awareness that sustainability truly is an organisation-wide effort requiring, requiring collaboration across procurement, sustainability, ESG, operations, product design, product owners and more. Typically, sustainability targets are 2025, 2030, 2040, 2050 forward-looking goals and quick fixes will leave many chasing their tail. Today, we'll hear about how the principles of the circular economy can offer an embedded way to setting us on the path to achieving these targets over the longer term. So let's introduce our exceptional panel. We have Dr. Nicole Garofano, Head of Circular Economy Development at Planet Art, one of Australia's leading and most trusted environmental organisations that partners and collaborates with businesses and governments to affect positive environmental actions. Welcome, Nicole. We have Peter Brisbane from the Government Partnerships Team at the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation, or APCO, as it is fondly known. APCO is leading the development of a circular economy for packaging in Australia. Welcome, Peter. We have Lynn Penny, Group General Manager of Procurement and Premises at Mervac, an Australian listed diversified property group with a strong focus on sustainability and with a range of sustainability targets on the agenda. Please welcome Lynn. And we have Tony Aloisio, Director of Ecologics at the Major Roads Projects Victoria, a dedicated state government body charged with planning and delivering major road projects for the state of Victoria in Australia. A highly esteemed and experienced panel guiding us through today's discussion. So let's kick off uh, this panel with Nicole from Planet Art. Nicole, please tell us what is the circular economy and is this a new concept? Hi, Francis. Thank you so much for inviting us to represent here today at this really exciting webinar. Um, the circular economy is something that is, it doesn't have a globally ag agreed single definition. There's actually about 114 definitions um, that are, that are uh, shared globally. Um, the circular economy, though, essentially, I, I do have some slides which I might just uh, put up to, to show what this is, if that's okay. Um, hopefully you can see that. Can you see those slides? Yes. Great. Excellent. So I'm just going to skip through these first ones and get to this one here. So the circular economy really transforms what we know as a linear economy, um, which is uh, commonly referred to as the take, make, use, waste model of consumption, where products are really designed to be put onto a market. Uh, there's little regard for the amount of resources that are extracted to make those products and even less potentially for uh, the markets once they've finished their use and they're in an end of life. So they're usually made, used and disposed of. So what we're talking about with the circular economy is transforming what uh, a number of uh, authors suggest is something that is a cyclical, closed loop, regenerative system in which resource input uh, and waste and also emissions and energy leakage are minimised and that redesign and reuse and repair of products become a priority. So it's taking something that is just putting products on the market to something that is actually considering a much more uh, circular approach. Um, from there, we've got, Francis, did you want me to continue? Oh, you're on mute. That was always going to happen today. <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> um, 100, 114 definitions. Wow. Um, thanks for that um, concise uh, explanation of the circular economy. Um, of course, we've got lots of procurement managers on the webinar today. So it'd be really great if you could explain to us, because a lot of procurement managers are familiar with the concept of sustainable procurement. So how does circular procurement perhaps differ from sustainable procurement? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that before I get into that, I'll just quickly introduce the, the three principles and the five business models, because this relates to what we're talking about with different types of procurement. So the circular economy has three principles. The first one is designing out waste and pollution. The second one is keeping materials and products in use for longer and at their highest value. 
And the third one is regenerating natural systems. So there's three, these three core principles are what starts to form into the difference between uh, circular and sustainable procurement. But we also have five business models, and these are circular supply, product life extension, sharing platforms, procurement as a, sorry, product as a service, and then resource recovery. So what we're seeing here is that the principles that are existing in the circular economy and these five business models start to identify what is circular procurement. So circular procurement itself is, it, as I mentioned, that also doesn't have a globally agreed definition, um, but it essentially focuses on reducing environmental impacts at its core. And that's really the main difference between circular procurement and sustainable procurement. Um, the key point of circular procurement is we're able to actually have the opportunity to influence the, uh, the value chain, predominantly at the use stage um, of the chain. So it's, it's in reality, it's influencing activities around the chain, not just in the use, but you're also making determinations of where, what types of products can be uh, procured. So where bulk procurement is conducted, for example, that's especially um, impactful when we're looking at making that influence. But really the difference is, if we look at this definition here from the European Union, um, we're seeing that there's quite a strong uh, influence of material flows and environmental impacts. This is where I was saying previously that circular procurement is really around uh, improving how we can um, flow, how the material flows manage throughout that value chain. Alternatively, you've got sustainable procurement, which is far more focused on a broader uh, suite of objectives with a very strong influence of social, uh, the social pillar of sustainable development referenced in sustainable procurement. So I could say that in this, in this little image here, it really sums it up that potentially sustainable procurement is the overarching uh, goal, uh, adopting the three core principles, environment, social and economic. But then we've also got circular procurement as one tool that enables us to achieve those, those broader sustainable procurement goals. Thanks for that. Um, that's a, a really great table there on the bottom of that slide, explaining how circular procurement fits in with the broader sustainable sustainable procurement framework, um, and also the pillars around environmental, social, and economic considerations. Um, as I, as I mentioned in our in the opening, we're seeing a lot of companies and, and governments, and in fact cities, setting sustainability targets, and they are multi-dimensional. They they touch on different things depending on you know, what a, an organisation or business can most influence. Um, very interested to hear your view on how, what role circular, the circular economy or circular, circular procurement can play in helping businesses and governments achieve their targets. Um, and um, you, you could also talk about some of the, the linkages between circular economy and, and, and some of these targets as well. That would be great. Yeah. So I think that, you know, it depends on what sort of targets we're looking at. We also, as you mentioned, we have corporate sustainability targets. We also have the sustainable development goals. You know, they are in and of themselves targets uh, within those goals. But I think one thing, if we look at this, um, this list here of, of different environmental sustainability targets, uh, some of these may be familiar. You know, we're looking at, um, you know, carbon emissions. We're looking at... Uh, sustainable procurement, we're talking about um, sustainable packaging, uh, green buildings, etc. So we've got some targets that are familiar, but if we overlay that with the circular economy value chain that I introduced earlier, we can see that these targets are actually mapping against those elements of, of that circular economy model. They are directly related to the environment. Uh, but of course, as I mentioned previously, that sustainable procurement lens uh, offers those, those more socially, um, socially related targets. So, so, so circular procurement can, can really support the achievement of these targets, these more sort of corporate specific targets, but more specifically, they can also have, um, they can also be delivering on sustainable development goals as well. Um, you know, just one, taking one for an example, sustainable SDG 12, sustainable consumption and production, 
a number of targets that sit under that uh, can be achieved by adopting um, a circular procurement. So for example, if we're looking at principle one, designs that improve efficiency, that also can address target 12.2. If we're looking at target 12.7, which is actually around promoting public procurement practices that are sustainable. So not only are we addressing corporate targets, but we're also addressing those global targets as well. Thanks for that, Nicole. And, and you're right, uh, in addition to seeing lots of different types of sustainability targets being communicate, communicated by um, companies and governments, we are also seeing in sustainability reports the linkages to the SDGs, and you've referenced a number of, of targets um, sitting under the, the high level or top level goals as well. Um, thanks so much for talking us through uh, what it means, what circular procurement means. Um, tell us about the Australian Circular Economy Hub and, and the role of kind of ARC in um, fostering learning and um, education and awareness around these principles. Yeah, thank you for asking, Francis. So the Australian Circular Economy Hub is a recently launched, uh, I say recently, November last year, actually, we're almost coming up to our one year anniversary, where did that time go? Um, so the Australian Circular Economy Hub uh, was initiated to act as a, a facilitator to facilitate the transition to a circular economy in Australia. And so the hub itself is a, is a knowledge hub that can support businesses and organisations, um, both pri private and public sector, to help fill some knowledge gaps around what the circular economy is. Uh, and we can also connect organisations with those who are adopting circular economy principles with those who are looking to. So we're able to provide some examples of, of where, particularly, for example, around procurement, there might be some exemplars that one can learn from. And, and one of those activities within the hub is, as Gio mentioned earlier, the, the ACE Hub Procurement Working Group, uh, which Tanya is sitting on. So it's, it's a... It's a knowledge hub that is designed to provide a, a one-stop shop, if you will, of information about how we can all transition towards circular economy in Australia. Thank you for that, Nicole. And it's, it's great to see the, um, the connection and interaction between the procurement profession and the circular economy hub uh, with representation. Uh, so we'll, um, thanks for that. We'll, we'll move on to um, Peter. Peter is in the government partnerships team at the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation or, or APCO. Um, Peter, could you please uh, tell us what APCO does um, and how it fits into the circular economy? Uh, I certainly can. Uh, thanks, Francis. Uh, and it is great to be here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, APCO is it's a, an independent organisation that works on behalf of governments and industry uh, to progress sustainable packaging in, in Australia. Uh, and so we do that um, when we're not an organization, we're a product stewardship organization, which means that we're about industry taking responsibility for the impacts of what it produces uh, as that, that material moves through the supply chain. Uh, but we're not one of those product stewardship organizations that collects and recycles material. Instead, we work with everybody uh, throughout the economy. We work with brand owners, packaging manufacturers, um, uh, recyclers, people who will use recycled material uh, to make sure that um, that that loop, that circular economy loop uh, can be closed. And there are a whole series of things that need to be done uh, along that supply chain. Uh, so we work with governments and industry, as I said, we're actually, when I say co-regulatory, that means that there is actually regulation that underpins the system, uh, but it's actually uh, an agreement uh, a non-regulatory agreement between governments and industry about how industry will manage the effects of packaging. Industry is actually, all companies above a certain size, which is $5 million turnover, are required to be part of some sort of system that does this, some sort of arrangement that does this. Most companies opt to become members of APCO because that way they get support and, and resources and, and uh, tools and so on, information about how to address sustainable packaging uh, in their own operations. Uh, so if we look across the supply chain at, at the movement of packaging material through the economy, um, we can start to identify what needs to be done in order to improve the outcomes. So there's roughly 6 million tonnes of packaging placed on the market in Australia each year. That includes business to consumer packaging and business to business packaging, things like pallet wrap and even pallets uh, and all sorts of things, cardboard boxes, etc. Uh, and what we find is that about 5.3 million tonnes of that, so a fair proportion, is actually recyclable, cyclable. And that is 
Uh, it's made of materials that can be recycled, so it's technically recyclable, but also there are collection processes available for it nationally, whether that's curbside recycling, something like the Red Cycle Program, or some other national collection network, a business to business collection availability, for example. But that does mean that some of it's not actually recyclable. And so we work to improve the recyclability of that portion of the packaging. Uh, but of course, not all of that is collected for recycling. There is actually a significant loss in the system uh, of packaging that's not recyclable. Um, so we, we um, or, or, or that is not collected for recycling rather. So we work with companies uh, to improve those collection systems and make sure that more is recycled. Uh, and then even some of it that is collected for recycling doesn't actually make it through uh, to uh, reusable materials, to become reusable materials uh, for use in the circular economy. And so we need to work out what sort of interventions are required uh, to make sure that that happens. Uh, thanks for we that. have a strategy. Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, oh, yeah, no, no. Th th thanks for that, Peter. Um, so just to be clear, because um, we're obviously um, always trying to understand what's a, a regulatory requirement or non-regulatory requirement. So APCO's scheme, this is a this is a voluntary scheme, is it, that that businesses um, and organisations can, can sign up to? Is, is that how um, APCO's framework is set up? Effectively, that's right. It, it's it's one of those peculiar things. It, it's voluntary. To, you don't have to sign up to become a member of the Packaging co uh, Covenant. If you don't, you have to um, be regulated by states and territories. And so there's an 80% recycling target for plastic or for all packaging materials in New South Wales, for example. There's a 70% recycling target in Victoria, similar targets in Queensland and some other states. If you're not a member of the Packaging Covenant, you must do that. Uh, so it, it's actually better for companies to um, to become a member of the packaging covenant. They have to do something. This is the best way that they can do it. Okay, and thanks, and thanks for um, clarifying that. Um, so you touched on targets. Um, could you talk a little bit about what um, the national packaging targets are for Australia, um, and give us a little bit of background around why have they been set? And what role do businesses, and this is both businesses and suppliers to businesses and, and governments, play in achieving these national targets? Yep, sure. So the national packaging targets, they're targets that were set by industry in the first instance. So APCO back in 2018 worked with uh, some international partners like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and some of our, our major members, particularly those companies, those global companies that are signing up for the sorts of um, sustainability targets and so on uh, that have been mentioned uh, already today. Uh, and th these are the sorts of targets that are being set internationally as well, if you think of the UK Plastics Pact, for example. So the first target was that 100% of packaging should be reusable, recyclable or compostable. Uh, and governments were quite happy to sign up to that being a target. The meeting of environment ministers back in 2018 agreed to that. Uh, but then we went away and developed a series of other targets uh, that would actually help to drive uh, the circular economy for packaging in Australia. First of all, that packaging should include an average of 50% recycled content across all packaging. So that starts to create the market that pulls the demand through uh, for recycled content and helps to address the economics of recycling. Uh, next, that we would phase out problematic and unnecessary single-use plastic packaging. Plastic packaging is, is one of the most difficult things to recycle. It has the lowest recycling rate. Um, so if we phase out problematic and unnecessary packaging, that's great. And then the, th the final target was 70% of plastic packaging should be recycled. Currently it's about 16% is recycled. So that's a huge uh, increase that we need to see uh, over the next five years. Uh, in terms of tracking, I've got some data here on how we're tracking against those things. Um, we have an 18% rate there for plastics packaging recycling. Uh, obviously, that's the one that really needs to pick up, but, um, but the others uh, need work as well. Uh, in terms of what industry can do, we actually provide a whole series of things uh, that that, to support industry. We, one of our major programs is the Australasian Recycling Label. We work with Planet Arc on that. Uh, it, it, it's a labelling scheme, but it's also an evidence-based labelling scheme. And that means that it's about telling companies what they need to do to make sure that their packaging is recyclable. Uh, and it has a series of different measures. It, it, you, you, it, it determines whether it is um, technically recyclable, but it also takes into account whether there are collection processes available uh, and end markets for those materials. So it encourages companies to get into more sustainable packaging. Um, there are things like recycled content. We do encourage companies to use recycled content. We've produced a guide that they can, they can use uh, to increase the amount of recycled content in their packaging. Uh, there are other initiatives that we're working on. 
we're developing a traceability standard. So when you start talking about using recycled materials, you have to know where those materials came from. Otherwise, it, it, you know, it, it, you're not really producing uh, rigor in the market. Uh, it's probably the sorts of things that the, the traceability and so on that Giveable works uh, all the time with those sorts of concepts. So we're developing a traceability standard for use by companies uh, in the recycling uh, system and the reuse of those materials. We've developed a pledge program where companies as part of their sustainability programs can actually pledge to use recycled content, which helps to generate confidence in the market to invest in recycling technologies that deliver high quality recycled content. Uh, and there are a series of other initiatives we have we have in place. I, I mentioned the Red Cycle program, which is about collecting soft plastics outside of uh, the curbside system. Uh, I mentioned Nestle there on the slide. They've recently developed a, um, a, a Kit Kat wrapper that has recycled content in it, uh, which has been you know, a food barrier, soft plastic recycled material uh, is actually a, a real technological achievement uh, that we've managed to achieve in Australia. Uh, there are things like uh, programs that produce plastic products for use, um, fence posts and these sorts of things, as well as infrastructure research into roads and those sorts of things. Thanks, thanks for that, Peter. And, and for our procurement and supply chain professionals on uh, listening into this webinar, what are the sorts of things that they should be thinking about or the inquiry they should be making um, of their suppliers when it comes to um, their consumption of products that high, have high volumes of packaging? Uh, yep. Yeah. So there's a few things. Oops. Um, my um, I did. I ran out of slides there. I thought I had another slide there. I'll just I'll just talk about um, what we've done in relation to procurement. I'll just talk right at the screen. Um, so um, we have actually undertaken some work in relation to government procurement. So recognizing that it's actually really difficult for governments. Uh, all of our members. We went through this working group process in relation to a, a whole bunch of different difficult packaging materials. And what is it that companies saw as the solution to some of these difficult packaging materials. One of the things that they all identified was, oh, governments should just procure more of this, and that would pull materials through the market and get things recycled. So we went through a process of, of working with governments to work out what the challenges and barriers and opportunities were. And we've identified, first of all, there's, there's a business case. So recycled materials are often more expensive. So what is the payoff? Is it a payoff in terms of um, improved performance? And there is some evidence, for example, that um, in some cases, the use of crumb rubber from tires or the use of soft plastics from something like the Red Cycle Program can actually improve the performance of roads. So there's potentially a, a business case there. But then is there also, and this is particularly relevant for local governments, is there actually a local business case? Are you actually going to be reusing waste materials that come from your local area? And so then we can start working with uh, investment managers and, and recycling companies and um, uh, government funding bodies and so on, to start looking at where the investment needs to be put into developing infrastructure to process local waste materials into reusable materials uh, within that organ within that area. And so that's particularly for construction materials and those sorts of things. Uh, but in terms of um, uh, recycled content in things like packaging, uh, we'll be coming up with a labelling system where we'll be releasing that uh, later this year or early next year. And that will start to tell companies and, and procurement managers uh, that there is recycled content in this packaging and that they are contributing to the circular economy by creating that demand. Thanks for that, Peter. And I think um, things like labelling um, help signal, obviously, to, to procurement managers um, those sorts of attributes in, in the products and services that they are consuming. We've had a lot of questions around getting access to um, a APCO um, guides and tools um, around you know, um, information that can help them around, um, you know, understanding this space a little bit better. Um, just, just quickly, if you could just refer the, the webinar attendees to, to where they might be able to find some of the information uh, that you've been referring to on. Um, in the uh, yep, so a lot of our documents are available uh, freely to the public, uh, and that's at apco.org.au. Um, if you can't find anything in particular, or if there's something you, that you're particularly interested in, please feel free to get in touch with me. I'm sure that my contact details will be available at some point. Um, more than happy to help people out. Uh, we also have some uh, products that are specifically for members. Um, and it, it's relatively easy to become uh, and inexpensive, uh, and in some cases free to become a member of APCO. Uh, particularly if you're, if you're a local government, for example, uh, you can become a member of APCO for free and have access to those resources. Thank you, Peter, that's great. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll move on um, to Lynn Penny from Mervac. 
Uh, Lynn, we've, we've heard from Nicole and, and also now uh, Peter um, about the circular economy and how, can it, how it can advance corporate and, and government sustainability targets. Murbach in particular started its journey early. Um, can you talk about your experience around you know, the setting of targets and, and the role that procurement has played in helping to you know, set, what, set those goals up and also um, around tracking and achieving those targets? Yep, sure. Thanks, Francis. So maybe just in terms of positioning, let me just explain. So Nervac is a developer, a designer. We build and own assets. And we see our purpose as reimagining urban life. So for us, this has, you know, this sort of goes to the core of our business. And we really do focus on this in every, every part of um, what we do. And so um, as, as some of the people have talked about, some of this sort of was driven, I suppose, by our overarching sustainability goals. And we have a program in MERVAC called This Changes Everything. And when we look at this, you know, again, it covers, um, you know, social, environmental. And one of the key things we started to look at is, you know, our impact around um, our procurement practices. And so we've really started to look at, and I think in the introduction, people talked about, um, you know, net positive and zero waste to landfill. And they're key objectives we have in our This Changes Everything program. And our objective is to achieve those by 2030. And so we've had to really sort of turn our mind to how we practically deliver on these things. And so what we have started to do is look at, again, every part of our business in terms of, you know, the development stage, um, you know, and the ownership stage, and how do we impact that um, in certainly when we think about procurement. And so um, I suppose the key piece is that it's coming from a whole lot of different directions. So again, we haven't sort of just focused on one little piece of the organization. We look at all of the things that we do and how can we sort of start to think about um, the circular economy. And to be really honest, we probably didn't even think about the circular economy specifically in the beginning. It was really about what are the things we are trying to achieve around the sustainability space. And really, when we started to drill into that, then it seemed to, you know, be really important to look at this um, piece around the procurement cycle. And so maybe the best way for me to articulate this is to talk about a couple of things that we have done. And one of them is around, you know, looking at the development piece and we were, when we are going to demolish a building and then put another building in. And so the other... Um, piece just to share with Mervac is we work a lot with um, the supply chain in any type of delivery. So Mervac has a, you know, a, a wide relationship with key suppliers. And what we have started to do is really work with those key suppliers at the beginning of any project. And so we really look at and, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, Tone, uh, sorry, Peter and Nicole have talked about, um, you know, how do we make sure that we reduce packaging, we reduce certain things, you know, within the supply chain. We try to sort of start at the very beginning of any project that we're doing and work with our key partners around how can we make sure that that doesn't happen right at the beginning. So one of the, again, a project to sort of help understand that and we talked about the amount of packaging that goes into products the amount of packaging that you know for us will go on to a construction site when we started to work with some of our key suppliers we came up with the concept of doing some pre-work um, and building before it actually gets to site and we've done um, a whole lot of work around modular bathrooms. So if you think about it, you know, instead of the, you know, the sink, the taps, all the pieces having to come to site, all the packaging that's related to that, how do we, you know, get rid of it? Um, what we've done is we've come up with building those pods actually off site. So then the whole pod just comes to site, it gets craned in and it gets put into place. So that had a whole lot of different things that came with it, but certainly that whole, you know, how do we reduce packaging? How do we make sure we've got less trades on site? Helped with our health and safety, helped with sustainability. 
So again, Francis, I think that just sort of is a, an example of where we've, um, where we've been working in this space. Thanks for that, Lynn. That's, um, that's incredibly interesting and a, and a great example of just taking a different, needing to take a different approach, um, perhaps to how things have been um, done in the past. Um, you mentioned, you know, the fact that you're collaborating with lots of different functions within your organisation. Um, and often we hear procurement, um, the procurement function talk about getting buy-in from the business. Um, when it comes to, you know, when, when, when you've got organisational targets um, that filter throughout an organisation, um, and often achieving those targets requires a real upfront consideration, as you discussed, how, how, are, how are complex organisations like Mervac, you know, facilitating that collaboration practically within an organisation? So I suppose, um, you know, to be honest, um, you know, when we pull together the This Changes Everything program, and so again, some of those things, and we sort of talk about it within our organisation, you know, is a bit like, you know, we're going to put a man on the moon, we're not quite sure how, but, you know, we're going to put that objective out there, and, and, and that will, you know, start us innovating and start us thinking about how we're going to make that happen. So when we when we developed the This Changes Everything program and we said, you know, um, we do want to have, um, you know, zero waste to landfill, you know, we want to be um, net positive, you know, certainly in the procurement space, we want to, we want to divert $100 million of our spend to social enterprises. Um, we were like, okay, well, let's put that out there and then, and then kind of like we'll retrofit back again about how we're going to make that happen. But again, it, you know, it makes you really think outside the square. And again, it's one of those things that, you know, if you, you know, you, you set yourself a bit, you know, a bit of a, an out of the box type of um, objective, then, then you do start to be creative and you do start to sort of bring it together. What, what we do do is, um, you know, we all come together and we talk about, um, okay, what's in our pipeline? So, again, I think Mervac's in a bit of a luxury position in that we understand what our pipeline is. We know what we're going to buy. We know what we're going to build. We know what we have to maintain, you know, year on year. Now, that might move slightly depending on development applications, but in the whole, we know what's going to happen. So it makes it that much easier in a way for us to sort of sit down and go, okay, well, what are the targets we can achieve in this year? You know, what does that look like ongoing? How can we make sure, you know, that we um, we have a view about what that's going to look like? And then, to be honest, again, you know, when we mapped out some of that, we weren't going to achieve these objectives. So then we needed to sort of come back and go, okay, well, how can we target some of this? How can we actually quite, you know, proactively look at what changes we need to make? Thank, so I think the that. key piece is, yeah, we didn't have all the answers in the beginning, Francis. And we still, you know, it's a, for me, this is an emerging market. You know, there's still stuff for all of us to learn in this. Yep, that, no, that's absolutely right. This is a, a rapidly evolving space. And, and so it is great to see, um, you know, the ways that organisations are really pushing and driving innovation. And, and as you say, sometimes it's set the target and um, we'll, we'll figure out how we're going to meet it um, to, to create that sort of innovative mindset. Um, thanks for that, that Lynn. Um, we'll move on to Tony because I, I can see that we are uh, rapidly um, going to run out of time. Uh, Tony, thanks for joining us today. Um, you work with the Major Roads Project Victoria and before this session, um, we had a fascinating discussion about some of the projects and material inputs that that and that you have been working on um please talk to us about some of the the projects that um you know use some of the principles of the circular economy uh, that you've worked on sure sure i'd love to um so ecologic is the organization uh, which is a government initiative that um, um, that I'm uh, privileged to be a part of, really. Um, and its its role is to optimise the use of recycled, reused, repurposed materials in what is called Victoria's Big Build. Um, the Victoria's Big Build is about eighty to one hundred billion dollars worth of road and rail infrastructure uh, that's um, that is currently. Uh, in progress and probably going to continue for the next 10 years or more, um, uh, a, a massive program of infrastructure development. Um, I've got a little slide here that I'll just show you to, uh, to talk a little bit about that or to take you through that if I can get this to work. 
who knows? Yeah. Um, and and it's really interesting because um, because it's a fairly unique approach that, that the Victorian government's taken with Ecologic. It's uh, it's got us working across six major delivery arms. Um, roads, rail, tunnels, um, um, and major projects all across Victoria. <clears throat> and you can imagine 80 to $100 billion worth of work um, in, in that type of infrastructure has a, a voracious appetite for materials and is really going to change the landscape, not just the built environment, but the natural environment in quarries and in supply chains. And it's going to disrupt a whole heap of stuff, and it's already doing that. At the same time, the virgin material supply market is being challenged to be able to even produce that, that quantity of material. And you match that with the fact that there is a massive waste crisis uh, that is uh, happening in Victoria and I think across Australia, the COAG ban on exports of, of a whole variety of materials that were easily shipped offshore until recently um, means that there is a, 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 the risk of massive amounts of material going to landfill and infrastructure just has its role to play, just as packaging uh, does, as Peter spoke about earlier, and, and other organisations and, and uh, other arrangements. What we've got is an intentional and very uniform approach to recycling and re reuse of materials uh, and a real focus on materials because of the, uh, because of the size and massive opportunity that, that uh, this uh, infrastructure build provides. Um, and we want to turn uh, uh, the use of recycled materials from what is ad hoc and opportunistic in our industry to business as usual. Uh, and it is ad hoc and opportunistic because um, things like reclaimed asphalt, lots of construction and demolition waste, crushed concrete and what have you, have been used in the industry for a long time. Ecologic hasn't invented recycling there. They've been used because they've been financially useful, uh, logistically useful, or whatever the case may be we're taking a different lens and saying, let's make business as usual and look at how we can grow that. One of the ways we're doing that is with a procurement policy called the Recycled First Policy. It's a mechanism that allows contractors to uh, maximise or optimise the amount of recycled content that they put into their project, uh, into their projects. And it applies across all of those uh, major, major projects. Um, so that's a little bit about um, you know, what Ecologic does and how the government uses, um, uses policy, if you like, to drive that, uh, that change. I come from um, the private sector and in the construction industry, and I've been in this role for a bit over a year, and I must admit I am uh, blown away by, by the power and by the potential of procurement policy to make change. And in this space, procurement policy, it comes with a whole heap of challenges of, of aligning a whole array of, of, of different approaches compared to the traditional approaches, I think, of procurement. Um, but it is a massive opportunity and it is a massive lever that I think we as uh, procurement professionals um, can use to actually do something good for, for both society and for the solving of a very particular problem. Thanks for that, Tony. So you've mentioned there the recycled first policy and, and sort of the power of putting that policy into place. In terms of then next translating that policy into sort of operational processes or procedures, um, how, what, what has that translation looked like and what are some of the challenges that you've experienced given the, the huge amount of volume and, and, you know, input of materials that are required to sort of, um, you know, put this into practice? Could you talk a little bit about that translation and some of the challenges that you, you, you're facing? Sure. Yeah, sure. So, so I think um, yeah, it's worth noting that uh, we're talking about um, a creation and development and connection of a supply chain that, that is very disperse uh, and fragmented and in some cases immature. So there are entrepreneurial types who have jumped on this already and said, I can turn plastic into this and I can turn rubber into that. They don't have the connections back to the contractor. The contractor has traditional relationships. The contractor has to apply certain standards and specifications, which are very complex uh, and very, very didactic. They're very much, this is how you will do things. This is how you will build it. And you have a client who wants to uh, challenge both cost and uh, other things like environment and sustainability. And you've got that whole chain um, along with innovators coming in and saying, uh, you know, we can try something different. And you have to manage and get that both policy and, and actual 
structural change to occur and to align to actually make it happen. So the resale first policy basically puts it onto the contractor in our alpha phase to say, what can you achieve? We're not putting set hard targets that you will recycle this amount of material, you will recycle that amount, but we're going to give you all these tools. We're going to give you this lever to say, yes, it's a, it's a recycled policy approach. We're going to give you all of these tools, which include things like um, reference guides, which actually, which actually have filtered every standard and specification in Victoria, and there are uh, hundreds of them, filter them by recycled content. So what is possible? And this is what is possible on your project. Now, what can you do to actually bring it to fruition? Um, and then facilitating connections between suppliers who have come up with new products and don't know how to make that connection and actually making that facilitation occur is, is sort of like part of the approach. I think governments are looking for attributes that include a product that performs, that meets the current standards and specifications and can do and last the 40 years or 50 years that a piece of infrastructure is expected to last and, and meet all the uh, standards, specifications, health and environmental impacts of, of, um, of the requirements and of what virgin materials actually achieve. I sort of might, I, I might just uh, like give an example of, um, um, of if this slide will move. There it is. So one of, the, one of the examples is plastics, which is not a traditional road um, or rail manufactured um, material. And I've just got three pictures here. Uh, Peter spoke about you know, the, the opportunities, what do we do with soft plastics and what do we do with, with, uh, with finding homes for these things at the end of life? These three pictures show recycled plastic drainage pipes um, to replace traditional concrete pipes. Um, in the middle, recycled plastic railway sleepers. Um, what are we doing using timber? Uh, and we have concrete railway sleepers. Uh, here's a recycled plastic railway sleeper that, you know, with, with the right amount of work and the right amount of research and development and support, um, you know, can become the mainline railway sleeper for uh, Australia, for Victoria. They're currently approved for low speed environments and, there's a, and we're facilitating some research and development with Monash University. Um, to progress the development of these into mainline applications. And to the right, and very excitingly, is uh, a recycled plastic noise wall. So anyone that's been on a freeway and seen the noise walls that are there, this is the Mordialic Freeway in Melbourne. It had designed 12 kilometres of steel and concrete uh, noise panels. We, convert, we managed to get those converted to a recycled plastic product. Uh, it's 75% recycled plastic. Uh, and we think we can grow that. Um, and that, that recycled plastic, half of that is the soft plastics that Peter spoke about and half is, is the harder plastics. It's about the plastic of 25,000 homes uh, that would produce in, in a year. So uh, it's about 570 tonnes of recycled plastic that is then recyclable at the end of its life. If you're looking at that picture, it's very light, very easy to place. So there's a whole heap of benefits for the uh, uh, for safety and for uh, and for on-site um, and for on-site access and use, um, and it has to meet certain performance criteria. One, it has to stop noise from bouncing back. Um, it's got to be graffiti resistant. We've got to think about fire. Um, got to think about UV radiation and UV protection. So all those sort of standards need to be met as well. And I've just used plastic as an example. There's a range of other materials that um, that uh, the infrastructure uh, world is looking at. Thanks for that, Tony. It's really also great to see sort of the, the images there and, and, and see them um, put into to practice. Um, we, we have about sort of seven minutes left. So I'm, I'm got, we've got some questions coming through in Q&A and there's one here that I really want to, want to touch on. Um, yeah. We have, and th so thank, thank you, Tony. And I'll open this to the floor, but it might, it might first direct it to, to Nicole because I know that she, um, she probably will want to um, answer this question. We have talked a lot about recycled content and um, recycling, uh, but the circular economy is, it is much more than just sort of managing waste and, and recycling. Can you, can you please share with the panel um, a couple of things or two or three things that you think procurement managers can start to think about sort of outside of um, you know, recycling and, and waste management um, that can enter the, the sort of the consideration process for, consider, for procurement managers on the circular economy. Yeah, thanks, Francis. I think for me, the one of the biggest things is um, 
that we see uh, recycling being considered as the circular economy, as if I'm doing recycling, I'm, I'm, I'm adopting the circular economy. And certainly recycling is one element that can be one tool that, that can be used to implement circular economy principles, but it's not the only one. And for me, the biggest uh, opportunity sits within that design phase. So principle number one, design out waste and pollution. So if, if for procurement practitioners, if they're looking to make some significant changes, looking at their supply chain, asking the questions of their suppliers of where those products, what sort of uh, material extraction is taking place to de deliver those products. Could there be an alternative like Tony was describing with the plastic walls and, and uh, railway sleepers? Uh, it's, so it's, it's asking some questions and some of them might be tough questions, but, but it's asking questions and speaking not only within your traditional supply chain, but, but outside of that supply chain as well. Um, so, so yeah, asking questions would be the first one. I, I think examining your own supply chain, having a really good look at it, and often companies, particularly SMEs, don't have the time to spend on doing this, but it's a really important first step is to identify what what's flowing through your supply chain and where opportunities exist. Um, and I think the third thing is, is being brave enough to take those first steps. Trying to get perfection is, is really the enemy of good. And if we can uh, be brave enough to take those first steps and, and then be okay with telling the story as well. So storytelling is a really important element of this that if you have say, made some achievements, great, tell that, but also be brave enough to share the challenges because that's what everyone's going to be learning from. So collaboration is probably a really big part of that as well. Thanks for that, Nicole. And, and I think um, a follow on question and um, perhaps uh, Lynn or, or Tony um, can jump in here. Um, we, we have discussed how the circular economy is, you know, really across the entire value chain. It is an organisation wide effort and often we need to think up front before products are sort of put into motion and um, how we design them so that um, we, you know, we, we minimise the, the ultimate um, waste and maximise the ultimate um, usability of, of the product. Um, practically speaking, from an organisational perspective that moves very fast, you know, decisions are being made very quickly. Lynn, Tony, how, how do we get this conversation right up front, uh, right up front and also how do procurement managers participate in that conversation? Um, yeah, I suppose you're talking from a Murbeck perspective. Um, so given it is our, you know, part of our whole DNA, um, you know, it's something that we think about right from the development stage. So when our development managers are, you know, looking at a concept, you know, they'll look at that. But, but again, as I sort of mentioned earlier, it's still an emerging market. And so some of it is, you know, um, you know, you're kind of juggling some of the expectations of your client, um, you know, sort of looking at the supply chain as well. But, but we certainly do look at it right from the concept stage and then right through the life cycle. It's interesting when you think about some of these things though, because, you know, a building will be up there for 30 or 40 years. So something that we're going to demolish now, you know what I mean? We didn't even think about what the product was in there. So that's where, um, you know, that real practical sense is where we start to build on our strategic alliances. And so as it happened, we're just sort of talking about this yesterday um, because we are going to start to demolish a building in Sydney soon. And for us, we have actually started to look at some of the suppliers that we're going to work with around building the building and trying to understand, okay, well, if we demolish the building and this is all the product that's going to come out of the that, what can we re, you know, what can we put back in? And so that's working with people like Borrell and stuff like that. So again, it is, you know, and we might not get it 100% right the first time, but I think it's a bit about, you know, it's on our agenda. Um, but at a more kind of, I suppose, smaller sort of side of things, you know, we have been doing work around, you know, a fit out. So again, for us, you know, we'll have a commercial building, you know, we might be swapping over tenants, um, you know, and that means that we'll, we might replace the carpet or, you know, we might do something like that. So we've been working with our carpet suppliers around, you know, how can we literally rip it out? fix it up and then put it back in again. So rather than putting in a new product. So again, and some of that is working with our clients to say, don't worry, you're not going to get a, 
a yucky piece of carpet, you know. But so again, it's managing a lot of expectations on either side. But again, you have to have the will and the want, and I think that's where we're we're kind of in that space here. That, thank you. Um, we we are just on time. Um, I know this has been we've had a lot of interest, a lot of chat, a lot of Q and A. Um, it might be worth you know circling back um, in a few months' time, and, and we can pick up on some of these these questions because obviously it is. Um, very much a topic of interest for the um, the industry and and um, procurement and supply chain managers. Um, I will I will um, I will close off there. Uh, thanks for all the panelists um, for participating today. Um, we really have uh, learned a lot from each and every one of you, and to hear it from both the industry side um, and also you know from Funa Ark and and, and uh, Apco as well as peak bodies. Um, guiding industry and government and thought leadership in this in this space. So I'll pass on to Giovanni to to close. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Francis, and thanks, everyone. I um, almost feel bad. It's heartbreaking to put a halt to, to this discussion because it was so engaging and uh, people were getting out of it because the, the questions coming through in the comments were um, a strong testament of that. Might be worth for the attendees to uh, put the questions in the follow-up survey, um, and maybe our panelists can uh, provide some short answers or links to examples and resources um, to you after the fact. So, thanks again to you all. It's been an amazing session. Um, I just want to do like a quick plug for our next webinar, which is um, next Wednesday, the fifteenth. Similar topic. It's a great example, uh, a practical one, a case study. Uh, around human rights and modern slavery um, from an outstanding organization called Apple and Denning have done uh, some impressive work um, with the support of uh, PSG in um, increasing transparency in their supply chain. So uh, until next week, um, please stay safe and well. Again, do share feedback with us and put some questions that you might have not had a chance to ask in our uh, follow-up survey and we'll endeavor to uh, get back to you. Thanks again, everyone, and a special thank you again to, to Francis and the panelists. It's been an absolutely uh, fantastic discussion. So thank you for giving up your time and sharing your knowledge with, with our audience and our community. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.